Boom. So this is exciting. I get to teach you guys how to make your own types today. Are you ready? Well, let's do it. So many things I will be teaching you. Uh, but the first thing to get there, uh, let's talk about this concept called a struct. All right, it's short for data structure. So try and think about what that's going to mean for us. Structure. And struct is a keyword in C++ that we're going to be using a whole lot right now. And so it's short for that. And let me mute myself because you guys look at my screen. So yeah, structs are short for data structure. It's a way of arranging data in a, in a pretty way, let's say. And it's going to give us the ability to make our own types, all right? So a struct, it's a data type that you make for yourself. All right, and so like I get to make a, a type called blah, blah, and I can make a variable of type blah called s, and here it is. And because it's a type that I made, I can put whatever I want inside of it. I can put little boxes within a big box. That's a new thing. All right, so you can pick the types that, that go inside and all the names of those inner pieces that we are going to call member variables. Okay, so that's what a struct is. You get to make your own type. Call it blah. Call it my type, whatever you want. It is a data structure. It's a way of like arranging data, right? Just using synonyms. Uh, it's a way of organizing that data. Maybe it's a bunch of different pieces of data, like an int plus a double plus a bool all together. That's a possibility. Uh, and then every piece inside of that data structure has a name. So boxes within boxes, like S has a piece, a member variable called X, a member variable called Y, Z, and P. So that's, that's the new thing that we get to build. We get to put all that together in one big box, and the struct builds it for us. All right? You get it all at once, which is very nice. This is kind of the same as like a vector or an array. That's one way of making a bunch of something. But for a vector slash array, everything had to be the same type. Now we get to change types inside, and then you also have names. So that's, that's new. You have names for the stuff that goes inside, and you can also have multiple types for those things. And so something normal that you might want to make a type for is like points. If you're going to make a video game, you need a point to keep track of like where your character is, a point to keep track of where all the enemies are. So you make a bunch of different kinds of those variables. Yeah. Could you uh, also make a vector out of types of blah? Once you have a type, you can make a vector of blahs. You can make a vector of points. Exactly. So you can start building stuff up, making types out of types. That's the beauty of it all. So yeah, let's... Let's go forward with that point idea. I think that's a good idea. It's like keeping track of like a two-dimensional point, let's say. So let's make a point struct, all right? It's going to give us the ability to make a type called point and then make as many variables of that type as we would like that keep track of like a two-dimensional coordinate like you would want to put in your video game that you're making, all right? So uh, this is how you would use that type. You kind of use it almost like a array. See that syntax? But when we say this, when we make our point P holding 2, 3, it's going to have an X field, or an X member variable, sorry, and a Y member variable that will be set to 2 and 3. You see how you get both of those all at once packaged inside of P, and it's meant to represent this idea of like 2, 3 as a coordinate. So that's beautiful. That's really nice. Uh, and so we want this type. How do we build it? We use the struct keyword. We say struct. And then we say the name of the new type we're making, point. And then it's almost as if it's a like a body uh, of like a function. You give a curly brace, but no, no parentheses. And then you put what you want to go inside. What should every point have? It should have an x and a y. All right, so you give it its name, and then it needs to have an x and a y, and you just declare them as if they're normal variables. I say, all right, I think you can imagine that we want doubles for x and y, right? Can move anywhere on the screen so your enemy can fly around it doesn't have to be integer coordinates only so double x and double y just declare them as if they're there and this is saying what every point gets when you make one and then there's one weird thing that you have to do at the end of every struct definition you have to put a semicolon here which looks really ugly and weird and wrong there is a reason for that and i can tell you uh after class if you would like or in office hours it's it's a weird reason but it's a fun one uh, so yeah once we make this, once we say this up above main or something, we can start writing points. We can say point P, point Q, blah, blah, blah. Let's, let's do that. Let's code that up. Does that make enough sense so far? So then I'll call this structs.cpp. So 
So, all right. Let's make that type. Struct point, curly braces, semicolon at the end for a weird reason, double x, double y. This is what I want to have live inside of that type, right? This is, this is me declaring that every point, every time you make a point, it gets an x coordinate and a y coordinate. All at once, packaged together. That's what it means to be a point. All right, and now I can start making points. Here's point P. Set it to two comma three like we had. That's pretty. That's pretty cool. You can make another point. Point P two, and this is a separate point with its own x and its own y. Like this can be two point five, three point five. And remember that these are like meant to to work like real coordinates. This is supposed to represent the coordinate two three for your program, for your game, for whatever. Okay. So that is what we have so far. We good with all the syntax. Slightly new, but we have a new type now. That's, pre that's pretty nice. Uh, let's see. So, with new syntax comes new words to learn. So, all right. The struct is that type. It's the point, right? The struct is the name of the type that you're making. So, we just made a point struct. That's how you say it. And then, every time you make a value, every time you make a variable that has type point, we call those objects once we state once we start packaging this stuff together, we call every struct's type value an object, all right? An object is a value of struct type. So P is an object. P2 is an object. Those are objects. Uh, so when we say this, we create a point object as a local variable. That's the technical phrase, okay? And then each piece inside, I've called those member variables. But there's other words for that. So every time you make point P or point Q, you get your own X and Y just for you. And those pieces are called fields or member variables, or just members for short. So you, you could describe P as this, like P has two double fields called X and Y. It's one way to say that. Or you can use the word member or member variable. Those are interchangeable. Okay, so P has two member variables, both, both doubles called X and Y. So those are just terms that I'll be throwing around. Uh, yeah, so you can make things. What else? What else? Uh, and then, of course, just like everything else, if you say point Q, semicolon, and you don't give values, this is holding question mark, question mark right now. It's, it's garbage memory, just like anything else. Same as before. It's just you got variables inside of your variables, is all. Um, so I guess the next step is, all right, we put stuff into our points. We got the two, we got the three, whatever we want. How do we get stuff out? That is the lovely dot operator that you've been using already. So uh, you can you can totally declare a point like this, point P, and that starts out holding garbage, but you can fill it in later and then also retrieve its values with this dot thing that you've already been using for other other purposes, right? So every object has got its own stuff. This is point P's X and Y. This is point Q's X and Y. If you want, oh sorry, yeah. So for when you're creating this. Mm -hmm. You can set those to anything like strings or uh, yes. Maybe I want to add a new field to every point. String S. So now every time you make a point, it's got an X and a Y and an S inside of it. Yeah. And so when you're setting point P with that string S in the struct, mm -hmm. uh, do, do you have to set S in, uh, I guess, object P? Or is it like you have to. Mm -hmm. I think I, I see what you're getting at. If you just say the semicolon, like, what does it do? Is that your question? Well, no. When you have, so when you have the string S, yeah. as you do, and then in the uh, point P and the point P2, we'll need to do something like that. Add a third, a third string, or would you, or could you see that as just two? S? I would just set that to one, and string would be uh, less than the same. Let's compile it. See if it's happy. I think it depends on the compiler, actually. Uh, yeah, I'll set the first two and not care about the third. I'll leave the third undefined. Yeah, that's a great question. I have not thought to try that, I don't think. So, yeah. You can give pieces and then fill in the rest later. That is totally possible. Any other questions? All right. So, say you've given some pieces and you've forgotten to fill in at all, or you're ready to get some, some values back. Like, you want the X right now. I want to print out just the X. I want to print out just the Y. Or I want to increment the X, increment the Y. How you get a piece, how you get a field out of your, your object, you say the object's name, and then you say dot, and then you say field name, right? So, like, I want 
p dot x, or I want to set p dot x, p's x, to 42. So that would do this, change it to 42, and we'd be happy. Okay? So read the dot, kind of, as like apostrophe s. Set p's x to 42. You know this already. It's like, go to s's, like, if you have a string, go to index 42 in the string s. This is, this dot is like s's index at 42. That's kind of what the dot means. It's acting on something. It's acting on p. Go into your x field. Give me that back or set it. Something like that. Okay, so that's one way to, uh, you can use that syntax to set a field. You can also use it to retrieve a field. Just say c out, and then you just say p dot y or whatever. Get me that piece of p, please. Get me that piece of q. And so that's another way to initialize stuff. And, of course, also to retrieve the values. So let's, let's go back to all that. So now, like, I can say q... And then I can give it a value later. I can say, all right, I've, I've now figured out what Q should be. Q's X should be 45 or 4.5, whatever. And then Q's Y should be 7.89. Okay? And so that's one way to set each piece. And then you can go and pick out each piece as well. So let's like print it out pretty, like a coordinate with parentheses. Let's print out P. So I need to print its X first, P dot X, and then like comma space and then p dot y. And that will print all of p, right? Print, the, print its x, print a y, wrapped around some, some pretty stuff. So that's, that's what we can do. Print q's x, q's y. All nice and pretty. And so we're going in, and we are extracting values. Okay? Does it make sense why this is printing what it is? Getting all those pieces out? That's kind of nice. Like, just in one variable, I got two two things inside, or how many, however many things I put in that type. That's a very powerful idea. Abstraction. It's very nice. Uh, let's see. So, yeah, that's one way to set things. You can also, of course, use that array-like syntax uh, just to set everything all in one go. Just like that. Okay, so... Uh, yeah, it's nice to have everything in one variable. What else can a, can a struct do for you? Uh, one nice thing is it gives you another way to return a bunch of stuff from a function. You know that if you write a function, you have to give a return type. It's like return an int, return a double. You can now return a point, and that gives back two things at once. Isn't that nice? That's another way to return things, uh, return multiple things from, from a function. The only thing that we could do before was like use a bunch of reference parameters and then just write to somebody else's memory. So that's one way to do it. But now we have this secret second option of returning a struct back, <coughs> which is nice. That's a nice thing to have, right? So just to show you some examples of using structs plus functions, because that was the last concept, let's, let's do two things. Let's make an add function on points, all right? So let's pretend that if you give me two points, like 2, 3, uh, and 4, 5, it makes sense to add them, and I will add their pieces. So I will... I will say that if you give me two points that look like this, the resulting added point should be, like, the sum of this should be just, like, add their x's and add their y's. So, like, sum the x's, 2 plus 4 makes 6, and then 3 plus 5 makes 8. Let's pretend that that's what it means to sum two points together. We'll make an add function that does that. All right. So this is going to take two points and return a point. Does that make sense? That would be nice. Um... So this is kind of how I want to call it. I want to be like, add, add P and Q together, please, and that should give back another point, and call it, I don't know, P plus Q. That's how I'd like to use this function. So let's make it now. So an add function on points. So it's going to take two points, right, and give back another one. That is their sum, the sum of their X's and Y's. So it's called add, it takes two points, let's call them A and B. So I can start using these types everywhere, and it gives back a new point. Isn't that nice? Uh, so yeah, I would like to give back a new point, so I'll make, a, I'll make one to give back in, inside the body here, point result, and then I'm going to mess with it and eventually return result. So what should the x of result be? Well, it should be a's x plus b's x. So result.x equals a's x plus b's x. See, I'm getting these points up here, calling them A and B. Result Y should be A is Y plus B is Y. I'm just adding those up. Does that make sense? Yeah. 
Yeah. This is a new function. So I'm making a function. I'm calling it like this down here. Uh, gosh, I can't show you all of it at once, can I? So this is how I want to call it. I give it these two points that I've made up here, P and Q, add them up, and then give me back a new point. Well, there is no library for points. We just made this type ourselves. So we have to make all, all of the operations on points, because C++ didn't know about it until just now. Yeah, we made it ourselves. We're rolling our own points. And so here is what it means to add points. We get to, we get to say what it means. We have that privilege. So let's run. Well, I guess I should print out the answer, right? That would be useful. Let's watch it work. So print out p plus q's, oops, p plus q's x and p plus q's y. That would be nice to know if it worked. Boop. And it sure looks like it's doing the right thing. 2 plus 4.5, yeah, that's 6.5. 3 plus 7.89, that seems to be 10.89 to me. Are there any questions about this? So it's just a normal function but it's using that brand new type. Does that make sense? Like we're taking our new type and we're, we're spitting back out a brand new type as well. A new object. We're returning a brand new object. Our point struct type. How fancy. All right. If we are good with that, let's make another one. Let's use a function that takes something by reference. Let's take a point by reference. All right, so we're going to not, the parameter is not going to be point A, it's going to be like point ampersand A. And let's do a negation function. So let's say that I have a point P, and it holds an X and a Y. What will my example values be? Let's say that it holds 2 and 3 as X and Y right now. If I call negate point on P, it'll take the P by reference, and... Therefore, it has access to the memory of P, and it can mess with the values, and negation means let's change 2 to negative 2 and 3 to negative 3. Okay? That's what I'd like to do. So let's make that happen. So let's say, all right, let's pretend that we have it. Let's use it first. So negate point on P, and what that should have done is change it to negative 2, negative 3. Okay? So let's print it back out after we run that, and it should have done the right thing. So this is going to take a point by reference. Let's see if I can... can't really show you both at once, sorry. So it's called negate point. It's going to take a point by reference. So it's not going to be like point A, it's going to be point ampersand A, because that gives you access to its memory. Ooh. And then it's not returning anything. It's just messing with the point you gave it. So it's a void function. Right? So what do we got to do to negate the x and y coordinates of A? Well, we have to set them. A's x needs to be whatever it was. Like, A's the x times negative 1. Or, quicker, it would just be like, A's x equals negative A's x. That's one way to do it. A's y is negative A's y. And so once we run this, we pass along P. A will become a reference to P, and then once we mess with A, we're really messing with P's X and Y. Any questions about that? That's gonna do this. There we, there we see it running and working. Let's see if I can split screen. Here's the call. It's gonna plop. It's gonna jump up to here. P's gonna be referenced. A's gonna be referenced to P. Mess with P's X and P's Y through A, and then here it is having had its values changed. We print out p's x and p's y. They really did become negated. Does that make sense? So it's structs plus references plus functions. Lots of lots of review. Is it, is it making sense? All right. So references are fun and they're a little confusing. So let's draw a stack diagram. This is a good excuse to draw a stack diagram of what's going on right now. So let's see how negate point is working on the stack. So here we have main. Main started everything. I'll draw very large stack frames. So what does main have? What's its memory? It's got it's got p, it's got p2, it's got q, it's got so many things. P, it's got p plus q, so it needs memory for it needs space for all of those. So we have p, which held an x and a y. 
which held two and three, and then it had like Q and P2. I will not draw those accurately. And then we had like P plus Q. So all that memory exists as part of main stack frame plus Q. Oop. That's all there. And then we call negate point. We call negate point on P, which is going to jump us up to this body. And then I'm going to draw that. I'm going to draw everything that negate point owns in green for that same reason I did that last time. So here's the call to negate point. It actually doesn't make its own memory. It doesn't need anything. It doesn't have any local variables. It has A, but when you call this, right, point reference A is going to be set to P, and that already exists. What does it mean to be a reference? You're, you're giving a new name to something that's already there. So where is A? This is why we're using green. Here is A, right here. You see that? Let me make it clear that this is a Q right here and not an A. That's a Q. So when you call negate point and you pass along P to a reference parameter, that just gives a new name to somebody else's memory. And so now, do you see why? When I mess with A's X, I'm really messing with P's X. There's negative 2. A's Y equals negative A's Y. Becomes negative 3. Yeah? Questions? Thoughts about that? Is it all coming back to us? And that's beautiful. Then negate point returns. We're back in main. A doesn't exist anymore, but P still does, and we have changed it. So that's why we see that. All right. If, if we are happy, we seem to be happy still. I have a question for you, so please uh, humor me. Go to the written ice page. Get in your peer instruction groups, and I'll clear this out. I would like you to write a struct definition. Let's say we would like to write a struct called line segment. So this is your job. Write a definition of a line segment struct that represents the start and end points of a line. So like here's your line. You want to be able to like draw a line in your video game. And so you need to keep track of where it begins and where it ends, right? There's a point for its beginning and a point for its end. That's what it means to be a line segment, yeah? And so if you can just keep track of those two things, you have a line segment, how would you define that struct? There are many valid options, but I want to see what you're thinking. And then here, here's my struct point syntax as a guide, if it ever wants to load. Oh, wow, it's really not. There it goes. I'll put it way up here. Any questions about the question? So write a line segment struct that keeps track of the start and end points of a line. That's what it should hold. So it represents some, some idea like this. A line segment that has a starting point and an ending point. I'll let you name them. So yeah, take, take some time to think about that and help each other.
30 more seconds on my timer. Looks like we got some responses. That was a silent alarm. Okay. Was that, does that make sense? What we got? Ooh, very nice. Very nice. I see, I see two competing ideas, and this, this happens every semester. How do you want to store the two points for your line segment? Do you want to say a bunch of doubles? Double x1, double y1, double x2, double y2? Or do you want to use a bunch of points? I like this one. I like this way. Uh, but this is equally valid. Very nice. So let's let's write some code that has both of those. So great, great job. You guys got exactly what I was hoping that you'd get. So you you can put your own type in another type. We all done attendance, by the way. I want to stop that in just a second. So do that if you forget. But here's the idea. Where was I? Uh, so I'm gonna say struct line segment. Let's uh, put this somewhere. Oh no. I cannot easily resize this apparently. Never mind. It can just stay like this. Struct line segment. Give its name. And then <clears throat> some curly braces. And then you put what you want to go inside of there. And there are two competing options, right? We got option one. Uh, let me not quit. Let's edit a new file called line segment.cpp. And so one way to do it is to make a line segment, struct line segment, and be like, all right, a line segment needs two points, a starting point and an ending point. So I need like double x1, double y1. And then that's the first point, that's the start point, and then I need x2 and y2, the end point. That's one way to do it. Alternatively, and I think I would prefer this way, uh, it's a little bit quicker to type at least, I'll call this line segment 2, is to reuse our point struct. We, can, we have that now. Let's, let's keep using it. What does it mean to be a line segment? Struct line segment. Well, you got a start point and end point. I'll call that aptly named. I'll call this start and end, and so it's a point. Point start. Point end. Oop, something like that. So that is how I would say I would do it, I think. Uh, point start. Point end. That's pretty cool. And then I can make as many line segments as I want. Line segment ls. Now, the question of the day is how in the world will I use this line segment type and fill in coordinates. Because what just happened when I made this, like, when I said, when I made a line segment, what did it just do? What is ls? When I say this, line segment, ls, semicolon, it just made a bunch of boxes within boxes within boxes, didn't it? So let's, let's draw okay. this. This is a little weird. So we have ls. What does ls have? It has a start and an end. All right? Those are those. Every ls has a start and an end. But what are start and end? What are their types? They are points. They themselves have x's and y's. So start has an x and a y. End has an x and a y by virtue of being a point. So we have a box within a box within a box. And that is logical. Are there any questions about that? That is very weird, but it makes a lot of sense. And so how would I set a piece of this now? Uh, if you just said semicolon, you wanted to set, like, I want to set this particular coordinate right now. How would I get there? Well, it's ls, and it's, it's part of start, so ls.start, that gets me to this point. I don't want to mess with the y, so ls.start.y, you're chaining the dots. Does that make sense? That is how you do it.
Alright, so I could say this. I could say ls dot x or ls dot start dot x equals two. So that would set the x of the start point. Set the y of the start point to like three. Set I don't know. Now I can start setting the end. ls dot ends x. ls ends y. Oops. To be I don't know three and four something like that. That would work. Alternatively, you know the syntax for like the array-like thing, array-like initialization line segment. I just got to be like, I have to say what I want. I want the first thing. I want the first, uh, the start to be this and the, the end to be that. But those are points. How do I make points? It's just braces within braces. Two comma three comma three comma four. So this is the start. This is the end. And they are themselves structs. And that's how I initialize a point. So... I can just keep on using this syntax inside of itself. That's still fine. So that's maybe a little confusing, but hopefully if you stare at this long enough, it starts making at least a little bit of sense. So here are the definitions, and here is how you might use them. All right? Are we good with that? Because I'm about to go into something more complicated, so let's make sure we're, we're happy before I do that. You ready? We're ready for the final frontier, what structs are preparing us for. So this, this is the end goal. This is called classes, and this is going to haunt you for the rest of your computer science career. You use object-oriented programming for the rest of your life from now on, and you get to learn about it today. I'm excited to teach you. I'm the first person to teach it to you. So let's do it. Structs are like the baby version of classes, all right? Classes are all about storing, packaging together a bunch of data. So just like a struct, put a bunch of stuff inside of stuff. Just like struct. Plus operations on that data packaged inside of it, which is beautiful. So the operations become part of the type itself. And that's very powerful. Part of the type itself. You'll know what I mean when I give an example. So let's think about this. What are some ideas that just naturally have some data associated with them and some operations that you could perform upon them? Let's make some classes, all right? What are some examples of objects? Because that's what object-oriented programming is all about. Classes and object-oriented programming are all about pretending that your code is the real world and you can touch it and mess with it. That just to humans makes sense. And so we have made programming languages that work like real life. So that's that's what, where we're going with this. So like, all right, a PowerPoint, this thing that I'm showing to you right now, that could be a class. What does it mean to be a PowerPoint? You got like, got some slide data, you've got all my drawing data, all that fun stuff, images. And then some operations on my objects, you've used those on C++ classes already. Like string is a class, vector is a class. You could be like dot add sly, like I want to add a new slide. This is an operation on my PowerPoint deck. Yeah? That's an operation that lives within the object itself now. So you got data as well as operations on that data that you could perform on it. You're asking, hey lecture 14, add a slide to yourself. That's kind of nice. Okay, that's what's going on there. Uh, and then same with like the idea of a dog. Like you can make a dog object, it has maybe a name, stuff like that, and like it has a wolf operation. Dot woof, yeah? And then we can make uh, a cat type, and we can make an object for my cat. And, like, what does it mean to be a cat? Maybe you have a name and an age, and, like, you can set those fields. And then you have some operations on you, like, cats can dot meow, right? You can ask the cat to meow, you can give the cat food, you can, like, have a birthday operation on your cat object to increment its age member variable. That's all very logical. Does that make sense? We have the data already. This is the new thing. These kinds of dot dot function calls that we've seen already with the C++ standard library stuff. It's just now we can make our own. And so it's like we're acting on that thing, acting on the lecture 14 object, acting on the cat called Lonzo. Okay? That's where we're going. So let's think back to our point type. We made a point type. What are some logical things that we would want to do with points? What kind of operations would we like them to have? So, all right, we would like them to hold double X and double Y, of course, still, but we want it to also, like, we want to be able to talk to our points. 
You want to say, hey, point, negate yourself. Hey, point, add yourself to some other point and give back a third one. Hey, you, point, scale yourself. Like, multiply your x and y by some constant factor. Those are some operations you might want to do to a point. And do you see how nice it is to be able to ask the point to do it itself? Like, hey, P, negate yourself. P dot negate. That's how that, that it would turn into that. Hey, uh, P, add yourself to some other point. Q, give back a new one. Hey, P, scale yourself by two, by a factor of two. And what I mean by that is, if that is confusing, what scaling means is like P has an X and a Y still. If they were like one and two, scaling by a factor of two just means multiply two into X and Y. So like make the X doubled, make the Y doubled as well. That's what that means. Uh, and this is how you would declare that idea that I want to make these operations. You just say, instead of struct, you say class. And then for a weird reason that we will not have time to get to today, you're going to say public and a colon at the start of everything. And then everything is similar to struct. You give the fields that you want to live inside, the member variables. I want every point object. It's still called objects with classes. I want every point object to hold an X and a Y. And then you start declaring as if they were functions, but it's inside the class now. Here are the operations I want points to be able to do. I want them to be able to negate themselves. It's a void operation, but because it's defined inside the class, it's implicit in uh, its... The idea is that you're going to call it like this. It's an operation on a point. You're going to say p dot negate, q dot negate yourself. That's the idea. So it takes no parameters anymore because just implicitly it gets itself. It knows about itself. Okay? Same with add and scale. And so that's how you would call these things, but you would declare them like this. We're adding those operations. Okay? I think this will make more sense once I give an example, but does, does that uh, confuse anybody too much right now? Any questions about that? All right, so, yeah, let's, I just said this word, object-oriented programming, a lot. If you've not heard of that before, let me define that for you. So, um, classes and objects and methods and members, all these new terms, because, new idea, as usual. So, all right, a class is like a struct. It's very similar. It just has operations in addition to that data that we're storing. So, it's making its own little type. So, like, I say point, P, but point is the class point now, not the struct point. It all works the same, right? Point is the class. It's the name of the class. Creates a type. And then P is still an object. You still call them objects when they're a variable of a class's type. So that, that still works out. Uh, it, but once you make a class, you get operations as well as the data. That's the key, OK? So it's still the name of a type. The object is still the name of a value of, of that thing, of that brand new type that you made. Fields exist, member variables exist, they're still synonyms, it's all the same, same as structs. But now, these new things, these new pieces, are, those are not member variables, those are member functions. All right? Member functions is the new word, also called methods, so I'll, I'll interchange those two words. Methods and member functions, those are the operations that you can put inside of your class. All right? And so, object-oriented programming, or OOP for short, is just the idea where I'm going to write a program and I'm going to make a ton of classes and I'm going to act on those classes with methods and they're going to store fields and have a grand old time. Okay, that's just the idea of doing that as much as humanly possible within your programs is called object oriented programming. Interacting with your code as if it was stuff that you could touch in real life. Hey, do this for me. Act upon yourself. Okay, so those are just some new terms. Are we ready to make a point class in code? And give it some operations. All right. So let's let's do it. So it's all the same as here. So we're going to say class point. Cool. Uh, and then we say public for a weird reason. This public implies private exists as well. So we'll get to that later. Uh, but we're, we say public colon. Uh, and then you put your member variables. And then you start putting your methods or member functions. And you, you can give bodies in here. That's fine. So I'll put some curly braces as well. I'm going to implement those things. All right. So we're going to put the member variables inside and then put the methods inside the class so that C++ knows it's a method rather than a normal function. Okay. So that's the goal. 
And just, just in case public seems too weird, let me give you a very quick definition of what public means. We're going to talk about it in detail next time, I promise. But what public does, again, implies the existence of private. Uh, it gives the user access. It's about access control, which I guess seems logical. It gives the user access to everything below it. Below it. So it's like, hey, user, you can access X and Y. Hey, user, you can use the negate method. You're allowed. I'm giving you that access. You can cut off the access with a, with a private, and we'll, we'll deal with that later. That's how you do it. So let's let's build this. Question first? If you leave it out, by default, it is the opposite of public. It's private, and so the user gets no access to anything. And we would, we would like to be able to call these methods that we're about to, to write. So yeah, it's, it's necessary for us here. It would be nice to be able to teach it without having to say the word public and pretend it's magic for a lecture. But yeah, we need it. So let's make a new file called classes.cpp. And well, it's, it's mostly the same. Struct point. Let's steal all this. We still need the double X and Y. What's, what's the difference, though? You still need the semicolon at the end as well. So it's class point now and public all over the place. <clears throat> and let me, like, indent, I guess that works. And then what do I want to do to points? I want to be able to negate them, add them, scale them, all this fun stuff. All right, so let me copy and paste all this in here. And this is PowerPoint, so it's not going to work, almost certainly. Let's see. Ooh, it's really... I think it's happy for once. That's nice. And so I'll give these bodies in just a second. We'll get there. But let's pretend we have this. Let's, let's use point as a class. What, what do we get? What do we gain out of all of this? So let's make some points. Uh, just as before, you can declare and initialize points in the exact same way. We, it's all the same as structs. We made an X field and a Y field. Might as well use them. Uh, actually, let me keep all of this. We're just changing it. So you can make a P in the normal way. You can make, let me, let me split screen so that's obvious. There's the definition up here on the left. On the right is where I'm going to be editing. So you can still print out P's X, P's Y, Q's X, Q's Y. But the addition now, it's a method. So it's acting on somebody. It's saying, all right, hey, P, dot add yourself to somebody else. Does that make sense? That's how that's going to work. And that will generate a new point. So add takes you implicitly and then just one other person. It's like add yourself. It's always a concept of yourself. Add yourself to some other point Q. Interesting. And then that'll work like that. Negate point, again, it's not a function anymore. It's an operation on the type, on, on an object of type point. So instead of this, I'll say p dot negate. And so you need no parameters because it's like it's acting on itself. Hey, p, go and negate yourself. And then that should change. Okay? And then maybe we'll make a scale operation on, on q this time. Hey, hey, q, go and scale yourself by a factor of like, Q or something, and then we'll print out Q's X and Q's Y after all that. Okay, so this is how I want to use these things. Does does it make enough sense as to why these declarations correspond to these kind of calls? It's like, because it's a method, you have to say the name of the object you want to call it on, dot, the name of the operation, and then it's like it's acting on, on that object. P, negate yourself. Uh, or Q, Q, scale yourself. So it's like, there's always the concept of who you're shouting at right now, having it do, do your bidding for you. P, add yourself to Q. Or alternatively, you could have asked Q to add itself to P. There's always a concept of who you're operating on right now. There's a concept of yourself. Okay? So that's that. Uh, are we ready to implement the bodies of these methods? All right. So what does it mean to negate something? This is kind of cool. So because of, I've defined this inside the class, like I didn't put it out here. Out here it's just a normal function, but in here it's a method, and C++ knows it's a method. It knows it's part of the point class. It knows that you're being called on somebody right now that is a point that has an X and a Y, right? 
So inside of negate, in here, I'm allowed to just say x. I'm allowed to say y. They already exist. They already exist because they are part of the object. I know that I'm having a method called on me, a point. In here, I can talk about x and y, and they are the x and y that belong to the current object. It's always a concept, concept of the current object you're operating on. To the current object that negate has been called on. All right, I'll draw a picture in just a second, but that's the idea. And so we say, hey, P, negate yourself, P.negate. It jumps up here, starts running this body with P's X and Y accessible. So I can just say, hey, X, change yourself to negative X. Hey, Y, change yourself to negative Y. And we're talking right now about the current objects X and Y. We're talking about P's X and Y, okay? That's different from me calling Q.negate. If I called Q.negate, it would again jump up here, but this time the X would be talking about Q's X. The Y would be talking about Q's Y. It's just whoever just got negate called on them, this is the X and Y I'm messing with right now. Okay? That's the goal. That is what is happening up there. It's jumping up here, and suddenly you can start talking about your member variables. They are your member variables. Whoever, whatever the object was that got this method called on it. Okay, so that's negate. Uh, what does it mean to add? That's just, all right, I have my own x and y, p. p is getting add called on it, so it's saying it's jumping up here with q as the parameter. So p.add, add yourself to q, it jumps up here, runs the body, and so x and y in here are p's x and y, because that, that's what the method is being called on, and then o is being set to the other point going to be Q, the one that I gave here as the parameter to the add method. Okay? So I was jumping up here, O is Q, but just X and Y, that's P's X and Y. So, again, I need to make a result, and I'll return that. But results X is equal to my X right now, because it's P, P, add yourself to Q. So, P, add your current X, you just say X, it's P's X, to the other's O, O's X. Okay? That's what's happening. That's a little weird, I think. So please yell at me if that is confusing. I will further explain it. <clears throat> but let me call this. Again, split screen. P, add yourself to Q. It jumps up here. X and Y are P stuff. And then Q is being passed along into O. Alright? So I'm messing with and returning those values. Okay? Am I good with that? And then finally, scale. What does it mean to scale? Just multiply your current x and y member variables by a value. So take your x, whoever this is, and multiply it by c. Take your y, multiply it by c. And so I'm asking q to scale itself, so it's jumping up here, and it's q's x and y that are being set. Okay? Because we're inside of the class point, it knows that those exist up here. All right. So yeah, let's let's watch this run and work, uh, and then I'll I'll make a drawing. C plus plus. C plus plus classes dash o classes. Boop. And it should be the exact same output as before. Like we're printing out P and Q. Uh, P added with Q, we are getting back, yeah, 6.5, 10.89. P's negating itself, jumping up here, messing with its member variables, negative 2, negative 3, and then Q, which was this one, has scaled itself by 2, which has multiplied those values by 2, and that looks correct. Okay? That's, that's the use of everything. Uh, yeah. How are we doing? Still happy? Too scared to speak. All right. So, uh, yeah. So first of all, here's what's going on inside of like an operation. If you say, here's p, and let's make a q as well. So let's let's draw some stuff. So they all have member variables. Every object of type point has an x and a y. 
and then P had what, two, three? And maybe, I don't know what Q has, question marks for now. When I say P dot negate, it jumps to that code and X and Y are available and it's P's X and P's Y. So it's going to mess with these. Be like X equals negative X. Oh, it's P's X because we're calling it on P. It's specific to P's current values. It's messing with P's X and Y, so negative 2, negative 3. It's not touching Q's X and Y, okay? That's, that's very important, and I cannot stress that enough. If I wanted to mess with Q's X and Y values, I would have to say Q.negate. Q.negate, something like that. Then it would jump to the body of the method again, but then the X and Y that would be available to you would be Q's X and Y, okay? It's always a concept of who you are acting upon, all right? I hope that makes enough sense. And so, uh, one last drawing. Let's do a stack diagram of how p.negate is working. One last time. All right, we got a lot going on. We have, in main, main has a p, which has an x and a y, and they were like two and three, and then q had some stuff, Right, it had an X and a Y, 4.5, 7.89, if I remember right. 7 and then there was like P plus Q. So we had a few point objects, but we said P dot negate, all right? And so what happens, again, I'm going to draw everything that negate has access to in green, similar to reference uh, functions, reference parameters. When I call P dot negate, here's what happens. We jump up to here, the negate method's body, so it's still just called negate, kind of looks like a function call, but it's a method call, all right? We're acting on P, and so inside of the body here, everything that's green is what negate owns. Whenever you say X, you're getting P's X. It's hooked up in this way so that X, the green stuff, is negates what it owns right now. It's talking about P's X, and if you just say Y, it's talking about P's Y. That's what's going on, okay? inside of that call, that specific call to p.negate, x is p's x and y is p's y, and that's why you're allowed to just mess with those variables. And they're changing the member variables of that particular object, right? So it's the current object's member variables. Those are the things that you get to see inside of a method, which makes sense. You're acting it to act upon itself. You have to say what you want it to do to itself, okay? So you get p's x when you call the method on p, and you just talk about x, right? I think that is probably the tenth time I've said that, but that's so important. Any last questions about any of that before I give you one last activity? All right, so let me let me give you all this code, just right now. Here you go. Really quick. Uh, let's see if I've done this wrong. First of all. Boop. So this will be on the code from class page on Canvas, if you would like to go there or just click any lecture, but here it is. It should be up there now. If you go to code from class, ah, code from class, click our class when it loads. My computer is trying so hard. And then lecture 14 was today. So here's the code that we just wrote. You can do, oh, of course it went to lecture 13. Uh, lecture 14, please. Slowly but surely. So much JavaScript. Uh, here's classes.cpp. So take that, copy and paste it somewhere in the class server if you'd like. Your turn. Try to make your own method inside the point class. Maybe like, hey, point p dot print yourself. That was something that I spent so long doing, right? Maybe make a print method where you can just say P, print yourself, rather than doing this all day long. That's nice. Or like P dot, or Q dot, I don't know, reflect across the X, Y plane, or the, the line Y equals X. Reflect, just swap the X and Y variables. Something like that. So try doing something like this. Make your own method and call it and watch the object change, right? That is the best practice, I think, doing it. So take my code, add to it. I'll give you a few minutes. 
yell at me if you have questions, and then we'll come back and wrap up. Mm -hmm. That will give you four minutes to think about this. Remember to put it inside of the class definition. So it's 4.20 is when we leave today, if I can remember that. I did, but you were working with a student. So I had uh, whoever was at the front, they, they gave me a little tour, which is nice. I'd never been inside. And then uh, you were diligently helping a student. I did not want to bother you. But I like the little flag thing. Yeah. I like that a lot. Makes it easy to follow what you like to say. Just be like, oh, okay. Mm -hmm. I was trying to remember what you were saying. Yeah, the question. Exactly. We should, we should implement something here for that. That would, well, that would be very nice in this class. That would make a big difference. That's for sure. Because we can't see anybody. Like, everybody's head is. Do you think the truth is about Exactly. We're all doing okay. Any questions that come up as we're trying to make our own methods? This is so powerful. We're acting an object. We're asking it to do something. And that is that's, that's human-like. And so that's easy for us to think about, apparently. That's why everybody loves this. That is my timer, at least, but feel free to continue working on this. I just want to wrap up everything. Uh, any last questions about anything? This is where we'll stop for the lecture today. I have polluted your mind enough. So there will be plenty more of this next time, though, if you enjoy it. Hopefully you do. So let's see here. We are in week eight, and we do have a lab coming up, but I'll release that on Thursday. And then I also want to talk about that as well on Thursday, but that is a problem for then. So it was just the lecture today. The rest of the time is yours to work on the lab that's already out 
and to ask lots of questions.